Hello, English 233 students, Dr. Evertson. Um, we are finishing up our summer course, and I thought I would put together a, a fairly short video to discuss a lost lady and your responses in the forum, and maybe tie this back to the final exam a little bit. So let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and share your screen. And I, first of all, I want to say thank you all for doing a great job on the final forum. I know that was a challenging uh, assignment to read uh, and then to have a three-part question like this. I hope the book club format was was useful as far as making it of interest to you all. Um, I also thought that it was helpful. Uh, I took a few notes to try and organize this video so it doesn't go so long, but um, think about how on the final exam, which everybody's completed already, there are two questions on a lost lady that were intended to sort of um, I'll make you think about what you've learned here at the end of the summer versus at the beginning of the summer and how what you learned might sort of relate to other works we've we've read this semester. And one of those questions had to do with uh, discussing the uh, the elements of fiction that we see in A Lost Lady um, in regards to characters, setting, um, point of view, symbolism. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to respond to some of your uh, questions in the discussion board and things like that. And the other one has to do with themes. And I hope that you've figured this out or saw this, that the novel was a nice job, does a nice job of encapsulating those elements of initiation and youth. Obviously, we start with a young protagonist in Neil, and we chart his growth over the course of the novel. Um, in relation to the lost lady, but is the novel really about a lost lady or is the novel really about Neil? We're gonna discuss this, but there's quite a bit going on there with a narrative point of view. And that could also be discussed from the uh, the elements perspective because we know from the historical essay, there was some uh, changes that were being made with the, with the point of view. So we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, and then if you think about youth growing up and this kind of, um, romanticized view of the West that is encapsulated in Neil's perspective. Um, love and desire, obviously, we, you know, we have, uh, we have a, a uh, Marion Forrester is having an affair uh, on her uh, aged husband. Um, there's uh, the, the scene where Neil has to cut the phone cord and everything. And in part two, after she finds out that Frank Ellinger has, uh, has uh, married uh, the Ogden woman, um, Constance Ogden, um, you know, shows how passionate and how, I mean, it, it addresses the issue of love and desire very much. And we can also explore and discuss where Neil fits in all this. Um, race, class, and gender. I mean, there are some racial elements in the book. Um, I think particularly when, uh, Captain uh, Fort, not Captain Forster, but uh, Judge Pomeroy tell, uses the the N word at one point, and there's quite a bit of discussion. Or we, we're going to talk a little bit about settler colonialism and the dispossession of the land from the original inhabitants. So there's there's some race issues in the in the novel that are typical of Cather are not fully addressed. Uh, there's the servant Black Tom, a few things like that. But there's a lot going on with gender that keeps this novel relevant. We're going to talk about that from a standpoint of um, Miss Forrester's role in this narrative and a woman's role in the West, a woman's role in society, a woman's role in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, a woman's desires versus a man's desires and things like that. Um, so, so gender and, and feminist issues obviously come up and then cla cla race, or I'm sorry, class is a huge element of, of this book. Um, there's a classist and a classical sort of view from Neil that gets transacted throughout the novel that perhaps makes him not a very trustworthy narrator. He has a certain lens that is definitely stuck in the past. And then we talk about nature, death, and spirituality. There's certainly a lot going on with time passing, with um, with mortality, uh, hanging over uh, the, the declining health of, of the captain. Um, and then with with uh with uh Marion's uh you know renewed life there at the end and she dies kind of unexpectedly um and uh there's obviously a lot in this novel about this house 
And we have, if you looked at the footnotes from the scholarly edition, so much discussion of the plants and the, the animals and the things around Webster County. Um, so nature and, and nature and flowers and gardens in a lot of ways are associated with Neil. So there's, there's a lot to work with. And then quite interestingly, if you read the historical essay, you know, um, that there's some associations with the Garber family, which was uh, the the analog or the model uh, for uh, Marion and Captain Forrester, um, that uh, they, Cather knew these people through the Episcopal Church. Um, and there's some discussion in the historical essay about Cather first coming to Webster County and attending the Baptist Church. And the Baptist preacher who eventually goes on and becomes a lawyer um, is maybe a model for um, Judge Pomeroy. So there's quite a bit of discussion in the historical essay about church and religion, and yet there's none of that in this novel. I don't think a single character talks about going to church, which is kind of remarkable when you think about what you maybe associate with uh, the West and, and with these Western communities. They, you know, the first thing you did was build a schoolhouse and, and a church. Um, so it's interesting that that's kind of absent um, from the discussion um, in in the in the novel. So let's take a look at some of the questions. And, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the scholarly edition and I'm going to point to some specific examples from both the novel and the historical essay to respond to some of your questions. So we have I have your questions distilled down. I've printed them off and I'm going to respond. But to do so, I'm going to go over here to the scholarly edition. OK, let's check in here. So I want to tell you a little bit about this historical essay from a literary standpoint. I know some of you are English majors, and if you go into further advanced study in literature, you may encounter more and more of these scholarly texts. This one is part of the process that's approved by the Modern Language Association. So it's an MLA scholarly text. It takes a lot of scholarship and effort to put something like this together. Um, and this book was put together in the late 90s, I believe. Um, and you'll notice this first name, the historical essay, and part of the group that was working on the um, the uh, the text and uh, and and checking the, the the. There's a lot of things that go on in a scholarly edition, including choosing which text you're going to use, because oftentimes in manuscripts there's variations that get published over the years, and you kind of want to make this the official text. And so the textual editors will will go through and they'll they'll look at changes amongst all the and they'll collate amongst all the different uh, texts. And we know with this novel, it was serialized in the century in three parts and there were many changes made to it. And that is quite interesting in the uh, last part of the historical essay where they go through quite a bit of that. Um, once you get through the text of the book itself and we get to the historical essay um, and uh, I. I was trying to point out to you at the beginning, that, and then you'll notice at the end also, there's a long list that hopefully you didn't read through this. These are the textual in emendations. So these are the changes that were made uh, in the text based upon, uh, you know, page by page, based upon what they uh, saw in different manuscripts and which ones they chose. And they wanna have a record of what changes they made to the manuscript. That's how granular and specific the, the editing and the scholarship goes on these scholarly editions because we're trying to get at a sense of why Cather, the author, may have changed one or two words. There's certainly a lot in this historical essay on what the changes, I thought they did a really nice job of describing the changes that Cather made uh, between the publication in Century Magazine and the publication as a novel form. So um, a lot of really good information in here. Um, we won't go through all of it, but uh, I will try and relate it back to the questions and the specific parts in the novel that sort of get at some of these elements. There's quite a bit of discussion in that historical essay about literary analogs. We know that Cather was influenced by Proust, by um, the other writers that are mentioned in there, uh, by, uh, uh, by, by her association with um, several writers of that period that, that were writing in sort of similar themes. And so the textual essay or the essay goes through some of that. And I also wanted to point out that this is uh, uh, Susan Rozowski. Uh, when I was a graduate student at UNL, um, she had published a book on Cather or she was publishing a book on Cather. And she was kind of a Cather scholar, a, a scholar of the West, a feminist scholar. And she was my research methods teacher and she's a wonderful teacher. Um, and sadly she passed away just a few years after I 
I went on to do my PhD work at Arizona State. But I really appreciated having her um, as my professor in my master's program at UNL. Um, and one of the things she did, I remember this quite vividly, she brought in some of the manuscripts they were working on. I don't know if it was on this critical edition or another critical edition. It could have been this one. Another one of the professors, uh, Charles Mignon, I, he may have come to our class. Um, he was a professor of mine as well. These are all rather prominent professors from the olden days at the University of Nebraska English program. So I, I feel kind of an interesting connection to this uh, historical apparatus, this historical essay. Um, and um, and so let's, let's address some of the questions here. Uh, the first question, I mix these up a little bit to make them sort of uh, a little bit easier to follow. So Zanesha had a question uh, from chapter one. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Annalise. Let's start with this question from Annalise. Question one, why is the title of this book A Lost Lady? That's a good question. That's a good way to start when Mrs. Forrester is not described or as or seems to be lost. So one of the things you're going to find that is uh, discussed quite a bit in this book is how reliable is Neil as a narrator, right? Because we have the perspective of a lost lady um, who is saying that this woman is lost. It's this is open to debate. Uh, I think Cather intended this. Um, I think in some ways, when Cather was writing the story from the historical essay, and as now I'm up in the air on this, I could be convinced in other ways, but I think that she did see this historical person, um, the uh, the uh, uh, Ronnie, uh, the uh, uh, the Garbers. Uh, that that I think she did see Lyra Garber as this kind of lost lady. And sir, I think in the story she imagined depicting uh, uh, Marion Forrester as a lost lady. But what does that mean? It seems to be that her reputation has been somehow damaged. She doesn't know where she's going. We're going to look at some specific examples from the book that sort of address this. But the idea is that she's a fallen lady. She's a lost lady. But keep in mind, that we're seeing this through Neil's perspective and he is maybe not reliable. We can talk about him as a character. He seems to have fixated on Marion. He seems to have objectified her as a character and it may or may not be the way that the rest of society sees her um, or this group of people that he associates with, the sort of old guard in town, they're looking down their noses or they're going tisk tisk, or they're saying, oh, such a sad state of affairs that's happened to, to this formerly amazing woman, a lost lady or whatever. There's lots of reasons to think that Cather is trying to be ironic in this and that it may not be Cather's perspective that a woman who does these things is indeed lost. So that was a good question uh, as a nation, it's a, uh, or Annalise, and it's a, it's a really fundamental question to try and explore. Um, I see that in your question, you think that she's not lost. Um, she maybe is just a woman who has needs, right? Um, Maybe she's lost and out of place in this time frame, but uh, you know, by modern standards, we probably wouldn't consider her so much of a lost lady. Um, so we should talk a little bit about the the narrative uh, point of view. So I'm going to pause here and find the right page in the essay here. So let's talk a little bit about this theme, the larger thematic part of the novel, which you all were to take up in the part three of your. Uh, discussion form, and maybe parts of this could be applied to your response to the final exam as well. So um, one of the major themes that we see going on if we go into this section on um, on materials, on composition, actually, um, is that we learn very early on, first of all, let's just remark upon one of the things, I know the historical essay is a little bit hard to get into, but one of the things they were describing in this book was the way that Cather's sensibilities were changing right around this time 100 years ago. And they discussed in composition what a great year she was having. She changed publishers. She went to Knopf, this publisher who, from Houghton Mifflin, who she thought they were not treating her as an artist. They were treating her more of as a commercial prospect. She wanted to be able to do more experimental work. And, and she wasn't quite so worried about making a ton of money. And so this is all discussed in the essay. And she also had a sensibility about her place in the world that was prompted by what we discuss in our American Lit survey. World War I had a huge impact on the whole world, obviously. And it shifted a lot of the sensibilities of arts. And uh, this is definitely has a huge impact in literature. 
And Cather kind of felt like she wasn't part of this modern group. And it's all right around this period where she's having this shift. She wins the Pulitzer Prize in 1923 for her novel, which had been published a year earlier, one of ours, a World War I novel. And she publishes A Lost Lady. She publishes April Twilights. She has this new publisher. She has this new sensibility. Now, in this composition, when I was in New York City, there was a panel where they discussed Cather and her uh, manuscripts. And they pointed out that they have some fragments from manuscripts of A Lost Lady that are in first person rather than third person. Um, in this essay, there's a discussion of going from back and forth from first to third person when when Cather was at Breadloaf and she was uh, doing some instruction and she couldn't quite find her way with this story. Um, and uh, this is all described in this part on composition. And I think there's a good quote here that sort of gets at this. Uh, Writing a lost lady was more complicated than such a chronology suggests, however. I discarded ever so many drafts and in the beginning wrote it in the first person speaking as the boy himself, Cather recalled. So I want to get at this a little bit because this is very fascinating with Cather. And, and one of the things we may discuss at this point is how much of the historical essay, the context, the background of the author matters. For many readers and for many literary scholars, they don't want to look at that material. They want to read the work as it stands alone as a piece of art, which is perfectly justified way to do it. That's kind of the way I suggested that maybe you read the novel first and then see some of the historical analogs. But I am a new historian, a cultural critic. I like looking at the context of the reading because I'm interested in what Cather was trying to explore, particularly as a Nebraska writer and as a regionalist, which is in my area. And I think she is saying things that resonate with those of us who grew up in rural isolated areas, maybe not during the time of resettlement or homesteading, but she certainly felt out of place. And we have all these books that she writes, probably most famously My Antonia, where the narrative perspective is from a young male protagonist who grows up throughout the novel. And in each of these novels, there's also a lot of um, obsession, a lot of, um, we might say the male gaze. There's a lot of looking at, talking about, interacting with, but not consummating or having any sort of physical relationships with the women characters in these narratives. So Jim Burden is very much attracted to these uh, hired girls in My Antonia. I think we see this obsessiveness in, in Neil uh, Herbert's character in this novel, and it can be. It's one of those things that may be uh, a supplement, may help your reading experience to think about why is Cather um, choosing to write in the perspective of a male, and what about this male's perspective and interaction with female characters? The obsessiveness with this one female character in particular seems quite interesting. And so scholars are, are kind of interested because Cather's own sexuality and uh, you know, maybe she was attracted to women. That sort of stuff can can certainly play into this new historical or cultural context approach to the reading. Um, but we see back that she goes back and forth in the uh, the first person, and then there's um, there's this idea. We go back to the question, the original question: Who is a lost lady? I think there's supposed to be some irony. I go back and forth when I read the novel about how much we're supposed to be relying upon Neil's perspective. I think we're supposed to be shown that he's kind of naive, he's a romantic, he's a throwback, he's stuck in a former age, and he's also guilty of those things that men do when they mansplain and they they try to go in and rescue women, and they, this is patriarchy at work as well. So this is discussed in the historical essay, though. Um, the Miss Forrester is described as a uh, an object of art, um, and that this... Uh, she tried this novel in three different forms. She knew that she wanted to have this woman described not from a narrative point of view with just the, the, the overhead sort of camera following her moves and then having some sort of commentary. She wanted it to be through the perception of another character. So in this novel, if you ask the question and maybe talk about this on our final exam about who the protagonist is in this novel, even though the novel is entitled A Lost Lady, 
and Marion uh, Forrester is ostensibly the subject of the novel, we're really, the protagonist is really Neil. We have insight into his thoughts. We don't really have insight into other people's thoughts. So it's third person omniscient, uh, limited omniscient, and, and Neil's perspectives are, are what we're sort of seeing the world through. Um, and in this, um, in the historical essay, if we go down, according to Edith Lewis, who was Cather's longtime companion, they lived together almost her entire life. She was definitely a business partner and an editor, but they shared an apartment. They were probably in a relationship. Um, but according to Edith Lewis's account, issues of privacy were also involved. They tried to sort of cover up some of this that was based upon real people. Um, and uh, I think that Mrs. Forrester was more a direct portrait of any of her other characters except Antonia and a couple of others. They tried shifting the, the characters to a Colorado setting, um, but her memories of Mrs. Garber and of the Garber place were among the strongest, most enduring impressions of her childhood. The whole ambience of thought and feeling surrounded them, and she could not transfer for it to an artificial climate. Um, so that's why we have this idea of having the first person and also this obsessiveness from the protagonist that's not supposed, again, not to necessarily be objective. He has bias. He is, you know, he has this moment where he first meets Marion Forrester in sort of an intimate way, and it seems to have sort of impacted his life for the rest of the narrative. Okay, so that's, I think, addressing the issue, issue of uh, a lost uh, lady. Um, another passage, I think, that does a nice job of um, describing this is, uh, I have it marked in my notes and 182, but it doesn't look like it's right. Um, that's when the world broke in two for her. Um, okay, let's, let's move on to the next question. Zanesha, why was everyone connected to the road? Um, I thought that was an interesting question, Zanesha, because roads are an important um, consideration in the work of Cather. There's a quote, she's quoting somebody else, but it's quote oftentimes attributed to Cather um, at the beginning of the novella, Old Mrs. Harris, which goes something like this, the road is, the end is nothing, the road is all, okay? So it's the process of being on the road that's important. And in this novel, which is about this pioneer period of the West, um, there's a romanticized notion of laying down transportation byways. Many of the characters in the novel are from what we would today, from a perspective of settler colonialism, which I'm gonna talk about here in a second, we would say these are characters that are valorized because they've come to quote unquote, conquer the West, maybe not so much to live in it, so with these railroad barons that are discussed over and over again in the novel, the people that are setting out the county roads and platting the maps, they're taking what from the perspective of the time would have been an unsettled land. Of course it was, they're resettling it with Europeans. There were indigenous people living in this area, particularly um, the Pawnee. Um, and, um, and so, they, they, this is a problem with Cather's uh, arc of her works, particularly the works set in Nebraska. Indian people just are absent. Um, not so in, in Maury Sandoz, who I don't think is as good a writer, but she at least acknowledged that there was this dispossession that's taking away the land. The novel itself uh, nods to this a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the road. So there's a couple of things from the historical essay that kind of get us towards this road. So all roads lead in the historical circumstance to the Garber house. In the novel, all roads lead to the Forrester house. And there's something about this house that's set up as kind of a, a beacon of refinement, of class values, of manners, of education, and of money, let's be honest. And it kind of is almost like a Southern plantation. And we think about what a Southern plantation symbolizes from a colonial perspective. Even in the case of bringing over indentured and enslaved labor to work a plantation, um, to take over an area, to quote unquote, civilize it, to, to make it kind of a colonial venture, 
we have sort of the same thing going on here, but by the end of this novel, the things that are represented in this house and in the Forrester household and all that, and indeed in the lost lady herself, is this brief period of time when there was still this settlement, this resettlement going on, this dream of quote unquote, taming this land, putting in the intercontinental ra railroad, all those sort of things, it's all happening right around the time that this is going on. And, and so uh, the novel is addressing this idea of roads and, and getting to a place of progress in the future and all that sort of stuff, and whether that's you know useful or not. Now, in the context of the novel, um, there's a uh, geographical space, and here you could talk about the setting, um, how people wind up, especially Neil, wind up crossing these two places in the in the creek um, and, and going over into Sweetwater Creek and going over into the Forester Place, and it's described with this meadow, and it's described with this wetland and everything, um, and, and so the road and the placement is very important. Now, let's look at the historical essay for a few cues here that might be helpful and, and make us understand the novel itself a little bit more. So if we go to the materials and models part of the historic essay, you have a lot of background on the Garbers and other characters that may or may not be sort of represented, you know, in fictional terms in the novel. And um, one of the things that's worth paying some attention to is that there's a lot of hope. Now, the Garber family on which this novel is kind of based, they basically founded Red Cloud, Nebraska, where, uh, you know, from a European standpoint, where Cather grew up, put the first plats in, first homesteads, and we're told that Silas Garber set up this lane of trees that were cottonwood trees. Now they're discussed as poplar trees in our novel, but planted these trees, you know, like 10 years before setting up his, uh, this fancy house that is the analog for the Forester house in the novel, anticipating that there would be these trees that were a little bit more mature when he moved in. And that's what happened. And so a lot of people gravitated to the Garber house. And this is discussed in the historical essay 30 to 40 years earlier, when Red Cloud's future looked bright, newspapers, correspondence, and census records had outlined the comings and goings of its first most prominent couple, as Cather would have known them, the Garbers. And then it describes how um, this house was built right around the time Cather would have been between the ages of 8 and 15 years old. Um, Bennett, 174, mentions a home produce play of Dr. Allen, and it goes through some of the, they had plays out there, they had dances. Um, the papers do make many mentions of picnics and dances in Garber's Grove, with special mentions of two large and successful picnics in the summer of 1887. In 1889, Cather wrote that she had been to 15 picnics in Garber's Grove that summer and would probably go to a dance there that night. A fine platform had been set up for it under the trees. Uh, in 1889, Cather would have been 15 years old, and three, these occasions in the years 1887 1889 were likely the ones she remembered when, years later, she wrote to Carrie Minor Sherwood that in order to write well, she needed to feel like a 13-year-old ready for a picnic at Garber's Grove. So we see that this is uh, Neil, uh, you know, you see that there's historical in her letters, and this is what literary scholars do. They're looking for these historical influences that may have filtered themselves into the novel. Now, the other thing that's being discussed in that idea of the road and the crossroads, I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the thematic element and what I would sort of reference as um, a kind of um, settler colonialism. So what we mean here is um, we kind of have this tendency in our state, especially to just accept wholeheartedly this notion of this pioneer myth. And with the Homesteading Act right around the time of the Civil War and making lands available out here that we have to be honest, were stolen, taken away. We don't have to go into all the details, but they were from a treaty perspective, from a, a legal perspective. These, these were dispossession of major lands through presidential uh, uh, proclamations and through violations of treaties. Um, these lands were, were taken away. They were not empty lands. And the, the United States government knew that they were removing people from rightful sort of possessors of these lands in order to make way for these 
adventures, uh, the, these ventures of having um, people from the East homestead to the West, manifest destiny and all that sort of stuff. Now it really becomes a colonial enterprise in this regard. You're taking the original inhabitants land, you're either marginalizing them or kicking them out of the way, and you're trying to then possess the land in a certain way. Um, and part of this in the Western standpoint is really an emphasis on extractive industries like mining, like railroading, um, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's cattle, cattle ranching, let's use the West as a place to raise crops, to raise animals, to bring up uh, minerals and resources and ship it to the East so we can continue to have this country grow. And then eventually both seaboards, Eastern and Western seaboard. And so that's the kind of notion that's being played with here, but from a standpoint that there's also victims in a colonial venture. And we want to talk, and also colonialism, like any ideology, like we discussed with patriarchy, colonialism is one that oftentimes has the victims um, be very, you know, positive uh, change agents and adherence to the colonial venture, that even though that's not necessarily good for them. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here. Um, so in the historical essay on page 192 in my book, um, it's quite interesting because it discusses Cather at this time. Um, she's, she's again in this, this period where she's shifting and she wants to become more of an artist. And A Lost Lady is kind of her last quote unquote Nebraska novel. Um, she moves on from this point forward to writing about other locations. Um, there will be some uh, old Mrs. Harris, neighbor Razaki, um, some other sort of Nebraska short stories or novellas. Um, but for the most part, she's going to, her novels are going to concentrate on other places. Um, the Southwest, the desert Southwest, in particular, New Mexico and Arizona. Um, uh, the Professor's House has a long section set in there, but the other parts of that novel are set in Michigan. She has a novel that's set in Virginia that grapples with the ancestry, her ancestry, and it's, you know, the time of slavery, Safira and the Slave Girl. There's a novel that's set on the founding of Montreal in Canada called Shadows on the Rock. Um, Death Comes for the Archbishop is set in, in the, the sort of Pueblo period uh, in New Mexico and from the perspective of Spanish Catholicism and, and the Spanish conquistadors and all that sort of stuff. So she starts to really shift. And I already mentioned this is World War, post-World War I. And there's a discussion in this. Famously, she wrote this um, this collection of essays where she was outlining her artistic sensibility. And one thing she wanted to do was write uh, in, uh, in an essay called the Novel de, de Mumble. She talks about stripping out all the excessive material in a novel. And then she also talks about how her perspectives have changed since World War I, edging into the modern. So let's take a look at a couple of those passages here. In this essay, Not Under 40, Cather herself used this expression that the world broke in two in 1922 or thereabouts. It's exactly the period of time we're looking at. So we know that this essay, this historical essay, is really talking about this shift in Cather and how the novel sort of mirrors that. The design of Cather's story reflected her sense that the world broke in two in 1922 or thereabouts. And Cather maybe a bit of an overgeneralization, she's more often associated and associates herself with what we might describe the foresters, right? This, this period of refinement, of high class, of manners, of trying to tame and settle the West, so to speak, and all the stuff in the novel about how things have gotten kind of grotesque and there aren't manners anymore and young people don't do this and that and the other thing, the world is shifting. That's her sensibility. And so the second part of the novel perhaps reflects that. So maybe it's not so much a lost lady for Cather as it is sort of a lost cause. Um, and uh, and so the, the historical essay tries to remind us that is the novel has a two-part structure, a backward and uh, looking forward-looking view. Um, and so uh, in this notion, they you go a little bit further down, they talk about the progress that's going on in this period between 1883 and 1893, kind of this golden period. The, the Transcontinental Railroad has finally been established. They're building railroads everywhere else. These farm communities through homesteading and elsewhere, particularly Webster County and uh, Red Cloud, where Cather was growing up, are being settled. Indeed, that's what brings her family there. That's what brought the Garbers there 10 years before her family showed up. 
everybody is building up these communities. There's an energy, there's an excitement. There's a lot of interest in, um, in progress. Um, skyscrapers are going up in the city. There's technical advances. The first English electric power station was established in depth third and all this other stuff. With progress, however, came fault lines. The American Federation of Labor was founded in 1886. There was a lot of labor discord. Um, there was a strike in 1892. We know there was the major recession in 1893. Red Cloud was having trouble both with its municipal water and its uh, electrical uh, generation, things that were trying to put it on its map. Um, writing in 1923 of events 30 or 40 years in the past, Catherine knew that a broken world lay ahead for the figures peopling her pages. Uh, world War I would devastate uh, Europe. And, um, and so she is using this theme of the Garbers to represent in her own lifetime and then the Foresters in this novel, this kind of golden age that's being lost. Now, the question is, this is usually seen through the perspective of Neil, and there's many specific passages in the novel itself that address this. And is this Cather's viewpoint or is it this naive character who's not really reliable, who's saying all these things? And, you know, the truth is oftentimes somewhere in the middle, right, on those sort of things. So for an application of this kind of idea of, of settler colonialism that, that we might, in a modern perspective, be a little bit more criti critical of, that Cather maybe seems blind to, it is acknowledged, at least in this story, um, with the founding of this location of this beautiful house. Now, Cather seems to be including it in this uh, story from a sort of romanticized view, and maybe this is how Neil, the character, remembers it. But there is this motion when the this notion when one of these dinner parties where the Ogdens come to visit, and Mrs. Ogden wants uh, her daughter to learn the story of how um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Forrester decided to build their house on this beautiful spot. And he says, her vows seem to roll about in the same way her eyes do. I want you to tell Constance about how you first found this lovely spot way back in Indian times. So if we click on the footnote, we understand that they say way back in any times, about 20 years earlier than this time in the novel, the Pawnees had been the tribe living closest to Webster County. The area had also been a favorite hunting ground for Omaha's, Otos, Western Sioux, and Cheyenne. Although the settlers in 1870s were fearful of them, the Native Americans left as game became scarce. The Red Cloud chief for 18th of January, 1884, mentioned that this was quite a curiosity to see them camped near Red Cloud. So, okay, so there's a reference there to this, this ending time. So we know that Cather's aware, obviously, that there were indigenous people living here before, but the rest of the piece also illustrates this attitude. And again, for me, it's complicated and conflicted because is Cather saying it was a good thing that Captain Forrester came to this place or it's just representative of an attitude of the time to look around and say, well, the Indians really love this area. The Native Americans, the indigenous people found this a beautiful area. Look, here are their fires. Here are their cultural artifacts. Let's build here. That's definitely a colonial mindset rather than saying, maybe we should preserve this pace for, for the you know, the uh, rightful inhabitants. There's this attitude of saying, well, if they knew something, let me take possession of it, okay? So if you don't agree with me, take a look at some of the language throughout here um, where uh, it's just basically uh, uh, dripping with this sort of colonial ideal. Um, it's describing uh, a sort of a, a sense of the West as empty and the West was not if empty. The freighters after embarking in that sea of grass, 600 miles in width, lost all count of the days of the week and the month. There's a lot of movement from Denver to this part of the area, we're told. One day was like another and all were glorious, good hunting, plenty of antelope and buffalo, boundless sunny sky, soundless, boundless plains of waving grass, long fresh water lagoons, yellow with lagoon flowers, where the bison in their periodic migrations stop to drink and bathe and wallow. And these are all images we associate with sort of this period before colonial um, and homesteading times, right? Um, so there's kind of a romanticized idea of this boundless, wide open nature and ideal life for a young man, the captain pronounced. Once when he was driven out of the trail by a washout, he rode south on his horse to explore and found an Indian encampment near the Sweetwater on this very hill where the, his house now stood. He was, he said, greatly taken by the location and made up his mind that he would one day have a house there. 
Do you see the colonial mindset here? He cut down a young willow tree and drove the stake into the ground to mark the spot where he wished to build. He went away and did not come back for many years. He was helping to lay the first railroad across the plains. Now, I don't know. I go back and forth. Cather, I think, is trying to celebrate and valorize this, or certainly Neil is hearing this story, and this is his impression. Um, Again, from a contemporary perspective, it's a bit problematic because you have all these beautiful descriptions of the boundless open plains, and we have this mindset of people coming in and saying, what we need to do with this place is set down a stake here and a stake here and build a house and you know put our Western ideals here. There's at least something worth discussing uh, about whether that's the, the appropriate response to seeing a, a beautiful spot like this that clearly was in the possession of, of other people. Um, so we have that sort of idea going on. Um, let's see. Other elements from this question. Um, after being introduced to Mrs. Forrester, this is from Alexandra. After being introduced to Mrs. Forrester, what are your thoughts about her? Do you like her? Annalise, is there a specific reason that we hardly ever see Captain Forrester call his wife anything other than Mrs. Forrester? Okay, I thought those two questions were interesting because there might be a tendency in this book to be very judgmental of, of uh, Marion Forrester as we wind up becoming judgmental through the lens of Neil. But if you think about it, um, from the historical essay, we know that, um, let me double check this, I believe in real life, so to speak, when uh, Silas Garber met um, Miss uh, Lyra Garber, he was 42 and she was 20. I think that's correct. And so think about that. And he had first met her when she was 11 in California. So on this section of the historical essay that talks about the Garbers, um, we find out that uh, that he helps to build Red Cloud. He becomes governor. Um, he's 42 when he goes off to California and he weds this Lyra Garber and she's 20. And then in the real characters, he does have this accident when he's governor that leads to a, a continuing decline in his health. So this 20 year old young woman, Lyra Garber is brought to this remote area of Nebraska. She'd been in California. She'd been amongst uh, wealthy people, these people who were helping to settle the West, so to speak, but a very polite society. And again, a colonial type society. And she's brought out to Nebraska and she they make it their mission to build this house and bring all this refinement and culture to Red Cloud, so to speak. When he dies, he's 72 and she is 50. Um, so that's a good run. That's 30 years she spent with this person. Um, but the age difference, you know, uh, we see in the novel, she's, you know, she has a whole life to live. Can you imagine getting married at 20 to someone older like that and then not having a regular life, so to speak, and being kind of in a remote area? So this discussion about whether you like, uh, like Mrs. Forrester or not, um, we can be very judgmental of her because she cheats on her husband. But I think we're supposed to have some sympathy and understand that Neil himself is being too puritanical, too much of a snob about this. That's my, my interpretation of the novel. You may disagree. You may think that author, the author, Cather, wants us to really judge uh, Marion Forrester. She is indeed a lost lady because she, she just doesn't behave well. But I think that you have to ask yourself, why is that their, their relationship? So, for example, the question from Annalise, why did Captain... Forrester call his wife anything other than Mrs. Forrester, they have kind of a formal relationship. They don't sleep in the same bedchamber. They have separate bed bedchambers. The suggestion that maybe when they were first married, they slept together. There's no child. There's no child as a, re this is his second marriage. Um, he, he's almost like, she's almost his caretaker, right? There's no sense. You don't see them in any sort of intimate sensibilities. And yet it is still a touching relationship. And again, this seems to be based upon some of the examples in the historical essay that Cather may have had in mind. The other way that we might think about this is a woman who we would refer to as a kept woman. And usually in, in novels and in society, that means that someone who has enough money is able to maintain a separate household and keep a woman ensconced there and pay for her, her, her needs. And then he goes there and, and you know they have an affair and all that sort of stuff. She's kind of a kept woman in her own house. Um, as long as she needs to take care of Forrester, um, you know, 
she's happy because they can have this, this these society gatherings. They can be the light of red cloud. They can be the light of sweet water. Um, and it's a very stimulating life for her. But as his health declines and they lose their money, she cannot live in a way that from Neil's perspective is appropriate for her class level. Um, so I don't know, we go back and forth on whether we like uh, Mrs. Forrester. I find that her depiction in the story, and then we might go back to what I was saying from the beginning about Cather's interest in inhabiting these male protagonists that observe and have a gaze on female characters. The depiction of Mrs. Forrester is very sensuous. Now she's described as not a stunning or great beauty, a kind of a plain beauty, but she had a way about her that was very endearing that Cather spends a lot of time describing in her mannerisms, in the way she talks to people, in her refinement. Um, and it certainly has a very huge impact on Neil very early on in his life. Um, I do think that this, uh, this sort of formal relationship between um, uh, Miss Forrester and Mr. Forrester is a bit more of a, like I said, transactional thing. I, again, I, they're, they're husband and wife, they're companions more than their lovers, obviously, particularly when his health starts to decline. And that you may or may not find that a reasonable uh, idea that she would then have needs as a woman and she would seek out intimacy and, and sex and, and, and contact and touch with someone like Frank. And then even eventually with someone like Ivy Peters, is she just using her body as a transactional way because Frank was from a society that maybe she could continue knowing that eventually this thing with uh, Mr. Forrester is Captain Forrester is going to go away and she needs to have a backup plan? Or does she just simply want to be with Frank because she found him attractive? Now, Neil, in both of these cases, he's not impressed with Frank and he's certainly not impressed with Ivy. He finds them ugly. They're not worthy of uh, uh, Mrs. Forrester. And so his 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 distaste, his his, he's offended more from an aesthetic standpoint. Why would she choose these crappy men than he is from a moral standpoint? I do think there's quite a beautiful moment at the end of the novel, towards the end of the novel, right before uh, Captain Forrester dies, that sort of depicts their relationship. And we're told that, that both in the novel and in the real life analog, that after... Uh, Silas Garber died, and after Mr. Forrester dies, um, that there was a devotion there from the widow um, to keep flowers on the grave, to put some sort of memorial together. Um, and towards the end of the novel, um, as he's about to pass, he keeps calling out, uh, let me find the page number here. I won't go to it in the, in the online text there, but this is the, the passage. He had time to think of many things, of himself and his old friends here. He had noticed that often when Mrs. Forrester was about her work, the captain would call to her, matey, matey, and she would reply, yes, Mr. Forrester, from wherever she happened to be, but without coming to him, as if she knew that when he called to her in that tone, he was not asking for anything. He wanted to know if she were there near, perhaps, or perhaps he merely liked to call her name and to hear her answer. The longer Neil was with Captain Forrester in those peaceful closing days of his life, the more he felt that the captain knew his wife better even than she knew herself and that knowing her, he, to use one of his own expressions, valued her. Now then this leads to the questions that many of you asked. Do you think Captain Forrester is oblivious to Mrs. Forrester's affair or does he know and choose to ignore it? Um, that was from Alexandra. Annalise asked, how long has Mr. Forrester's affair been going on with Ellinger? Does Captain Forrester know about it? So now being from Neil's perspective, we learn about it gradually as well. And I hope you see when you're reading the novel, Neil is pretty naive to not know that there's something going on there um, or to be shocked that she would be having relations with anybody else. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think that maybe is a clue. And then there's another clue on... Um, uh, on page 56 and 57. Let me find these pa passages and we'll talk about them here. I think a good example of this is the night of the dinner party with the Ogdens. And uh, we know that there's an attempt to maybe hook up Neil and Constance and, and yet she clearly has a shine towards 
uh, Frank Ellinger. And at this point, we don't know that there's anything going on uh, between uh, Mrs. Forrester and Frank. But look, now that you've read the novel and you know this, with this in your mind, read through these passages. They're quite kind of shocking. When the iron bed creaked at receiving the, the heavy figure of uh, Dr. Forrester, she called from the big bedroom, good night, Mr. Forrester, and drew the heavy curtains that shut off the alcove. She took off her rings and earrings and was beginning to unfasten her black velvet bodice when a tinkle of glass from without, she stopped short, rehooking her shoulder of her gown. Now she's in an evening gown. She's dressed for bed, right? She goes back downstairs and uh, she finds that Frank is out drinking the French brandy. And now you first... You know, rather familiar, right? He, he seems to be just, uh, he, I mean, in some ways he's cuckolding uh, uh, Mr. Forrester and now he's drinking his brandy in his house. And so I don't know what you think about that as a character, but um, she goes down. Uh, be careful, she murmured as she approached him. I have a distinct impression that there is someone on the enclosed stairway. There is a wide crack in the door. Ah, but kitten, kittens have claws these days. Pour me a little, thank you. I'll have mine in by the fire. Um, so here she's suggesting that she knows that Constance Ogden is flittering about in the stairway and is maybe seeking a tryst with uh, Frank or something like that. That's how I interpret those lines. Um, he followed her into the next room where she stood by the gate looking at him in the light pale blue flames that ran over the fresh coal. You've had good many brandies, Frank, she said, studying his flushed, masterful face. Not too many. I'll need them tonight, he replied meaningly. And he needs them tonight because he needs a cold shower. He wants to be with Mrs. Forrester, right? And they can't be together and it's frustrating him. Um, or maybe he'll need them tonight to sleep through it in case Constance is going to try and come and bug him. Um, she nervously brushed back a lock of hair that had come down a little. It's not tonight, it's morning. Go to bed and sleep as late as you please. Take care. I heard silk stockings on the stairs. Good night. Now that would be Constance, right? She put her hand on the sleeve of his coat. Again, a rather intimate gesture. The white fingers clung to the black cloth as bits of paper cling to magnetized iron. What a, what a description. Her touch, soft as it was, went through the man, all the feet and inches of him. His broad shoulders lifted on a deep breath. He looked down at her. Her eyes fell. Good night, she said faintly as she turned quickly away. The train of her velvet dress caught the leg of his broadcloth trousers and dragged with a friction that crackled and threw sparks. Both started. They stood looking at each other for a moment before she actually slipped through the door. Ellinger remained by the hearth, his arms folded tight over his chest, his curly lip compressed, frowning into the fire. Now, in this day and age where you can see any manner of nakedness and sexual acts on television programs and on the internet all the time, maybe we're not sort of shocked, but the passion and the innuendo and the intimacy and that the crackling sparks, Cather is really good at describing these very sort of sexual, sensual moments uh, and the frustration between people who can't be together. Um, I think it's really quite uh, amazing writing there. The other thing we might point out there is that remember that Neil and his uncle have left the party at this point. So this is one of those rare moments in the narrative where Neil is not present. So uh, if she had chosen to stick with first person, we never would have been able to have this scene because you could really only see what Neil witnesses. And here he stepped away from this kind of an interesting moment in the narrative. And Cather does that. She's not so strict and beholden to her own rules some of the times. Um, and then uh, there's another, probably the more um, the more uh, known sort of instance is uh, uh, towards the end there, uh, where Neil is visiting the captain, and he sees in the basket of letters that need to go out that uh, that uh, Mrs. Forrester has written a, a letter to Frank, um, and so um, so. Uh, he says to her script looked as if it had been done in a high pitch of speed. Um, oh, yes, Captain, I'm never able to take any letters for Mr. Mrs. Forrester without looking at them. No one could forget her writing. Yes, it's very exceptional. The captain gave him the envelope and with his cane went slowly toward the chair, his big chair. Neil had often wondered just how much the captain knew because uh, Frank's name is on the letter. Now, as he went down the hill, he felt sure that he knew everything. 
more than anyone else, all there was to know about Marion Forrester. So there's this idea that he's a gentleman, he wants his wife as a companion, and maybe he's okay with her having these uh, companions and relations outside of their marriage because she knows that she's young and he has certain needs. I don't know, you, you can speculate on that, that all you want, but that's really, really great questions that everybody asked about that. So then Alexandra has this uh, question. Mrs. Forrester is used to a lavish lifestyle. Now that they have lost everything, do you believe her when she says they will manage? And do you think she has some resentment towards her husband for this? All I would say in this part of the narrative is that it brings back some of these issues of what we discussed this semester in regards to class. And again, here we have kind of a, an impression through Neil where he is pretty impressed uh that despite well first of all he he this is where the class and the snobbishness i don't quite get because he 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 is he's so upset that this money is going to be lost for this prominent family because it's going to be a diminution or it's going to be a step down for this woman that he's kind of idealized it's not a real person in his mind he, he she's an angel who who needs all the money in the world to keep her manners and her high class in and he can't imagine a diminished mrs forrester without money that in and of itself is kind of a snobbish class centric way i mean why should the foresters have more money than anybody else in that panic of 1893 and the recession that followed Lots of people were losing money. The farmers and all the people that were having a lot of troubles. Um, there was a drought in Nebraska and then there was a terrible blizzard. Um, ranchers were losing their cattle. And we're worried about whether Mrs. Forrester is gonna be able to have the right silver plates. Um, you know, it's, it's it, I think Cather is trying to have a see that Neil is sort of become entrapped in sort of an idea of noblesse oblige. These older aristocratic families need to be held up as a kind of ideal. Um, and part of this general discussion of class and uh, 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 a wealthy class that is settling the West, so to speak, and they're, they're the, the scions of industry, they're mining, they're extracting, they're railroads, they're big dreamers, all this stuff that Cather talks about at the end of the novel, or at least that Neil uh, interprets for us. Um, it all is associated with this idea um, that there is uh, perhaps a naive understanding of old business versus new business. The old ways were ethical and people stood on principle and they were gentlemen, right? And in the new ways, there's all these, the term shyster is used and there's all these cheating business people. So this is really expressed most fully um, in, uh, in the section of the, the story uh, that, 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 uh, that shows the judge and, uh, and Mr. Forrester coming back from having to deal with this bank default. So this appears I guess this is chapter eight in the first part of the book. And this is, again, they come back and there's an explanation of what's happened. And there's this long discussion. This is where the footnotes help because they explained to us there was this bank run. And um, and rather than letting the, the people who made these deposits default and Mr. Forrester was associated with his bank um, and the Silas Garber example that is the analog from Willa Cather's real life, he was the president of the bank. So Forrester is associated with this bank. He got other people from railroad businesses and working class schmoes to invest. And a lot is put into this section of describing about how all these working class folk had their money invested in this bank and they were going to lose it all unless, um, unless Mr. Forrester made the depositors whole and the business people who had the means and the ability to maybe absorb the loss or take a delayed payout. They wanted their money right away. They were processing the bank run. And this is where uh, Captain Forrester and Pomeroy, Pomer Judge Pomeroy especially, Pomeroy is very critical of these people. They're just toothless. Um, they're not noble business people anymore, and it's the olden days. And so we're to take that there were these low working class people that had their money, and because Forrester was willing to take his property and put it in debt and then take the money on those loans and put it in the bank, he makes everybody whole. But that means that Marion and he are going to have to live only on his pension. Oh, my God, right? Uh, and this beautiful house to 
rebuilt. Um, and so what a step down, right? And there's this, you know, there's this element of class, a stripping of sort of class division of aristocracy, of snobbishness. And there's also this problematic language here. It's like when uh, the judge is describing um, this situation, uh, Captain Forrester had stood firm, where is that? Had stood firm that not one of his depositors should lose a dollar. Um, at this part of the narrative, the judge rose and began to pace the fort, twisting the seals on his watch chain. That was what a man of honor was bound to do, Mrs. Forrester. When five of the directors backing down, he had to either lose his name or save it. The depositors had put their savings into the bank because Captain Forrester was president. To those men with no capital but their back in their hands, this his name meant safety, and he wasn't going to give up his, uh, his name. Um, and then he gets to this, this it's a long, um, long paragraph, isn't it? And there at the end, though, but upon my honor, I couldn't forbid him. And as, as for those white-livered rascals that sat there, the judge stopped before Mrs. Forrester and ruffled his bushy white hair with both hands. By God, madam, I think I've lived too long. In my day, the difference between a businessman and a scoundrel was bigger than the difference between a white man and an N-word. Why on earth is he using that language? Well, Captain Forrester served in the Civil War, comes kind of from the South. Um, it's an over-familiarization with that. Should we fault Cather for using that? Is it meant to indicate that these men aren't necessarily to be respected in these views about how they were upholding an honor? When I read this novel, I like to think, well, these folks that made all this money on the railroad and on mining and other things were really kind of raping the West. They're taking all the goods out of the West and they're moving them to the East. And they, we want to think that they're gentlemen and that they're these, these high-minded dreamers. But in, in our modern sensibility, we think of them as kind of destructive. And um, the working class people in these areas, and of course, the indigenous people that got dispossessed, the minorities that had to move in and help lay the rate railroad, you know, the Chinese, and then they got kicked out of the country in the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Uh, what about all the, the, uh, the, uh, the Mexicans and the Mexican-Americans and the Texicans and all those people coming up in the South? Um, and, and into these areas and then being involved. I think if you think of Colorado and these other areas that were originally a, a part of a Spanish colony, um, that, that there's a lot that's going on here that, that is being glossed over in this sort of valorized, dreamlike, building up communities uh, perspective. And I'm not saying Cather is making this critique. I said, I'm making this critique and I wonder if that's what um, some of what uh, is is being uh, discussed in this in this novel. Uh, it whether it's meant to be ironic or whether we're meant to take it at face value that Neil's right that these men were the honorable business people, and now moving into this new era, they are being supplanted by the scoundrels like Ivy Peters, who we see in book two, has gone and he has earned his law degree, and now he's a quote unquote shyster lawyer. And we do learn that he himself is involved in these schemes in Wyoming of dispossessing Indian people of their lands um, during this sort of severalty acts when the reservations were being broken up. And a lot of money, a lot of land and money went into white people's hands at the, at the victimization of, of indigenous people in this regard. And Ivy's involved in this, and he's got Mrs. Forrester involved in this. But there's this idea in the second part of the book, especially, if you look at that section where Miss Forrester is talking to uh, to Neil about you're just not you're too honest basically and and you 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 don't know business you you're still in the old way of thinking about business this is why I think Cather is perhaps wanting us to see Neil's perspective as ironic and not her own she's not promoting an idea that these men are necessarily unassailable they've made mistakes as well and uh, and maybe Ivy Peters if you think about it. A working class schmo who who grew up in the area wasn't allowed on the forester land to hunt. What is this? Uh, England in the you know 1500s, where the the king could shoot someone for simply uh, poaching a deer. Not on the king's land anywhere in England. People were executed for this sort of thing. So there's this kind of you know serf uh, peasant and uh, and uh, and uh, and patron sort of relationship here. And Ivy Peters breaks through that. And why is this any different than the beautiful story that we're told in polite society over snifters of brandy and cigars 
about how Captain Forrester came upon this land that the Indians were using and it was so beautiful and so productive and so fertile. And he's like, someday I'm gonna make this my house. And he strives in these stakes. And then Ivy Peters at the first part of the book were to understand at least through Neil's perspective, he doesn't belong there. He's a low class, low life, right? He doesn't, he doesn't deserve to be walking across their property. And yet Ivy Peters has his own eye on that same property. And how is he better, different? He's the same as Captain Forrester. And in fact, from our perspective, we should maybe be more in allegiance with Ivy Peters. He didn't get, he didn't come from a wealthy family. He didn't have money to invest in railroads. He did it all on his own. And now through these business schemes, now they're, they're shady. They're not great. Uh, he's going through and, and making a name for himself. And he's becoming a person in town who is, you know, perhaps lawyering for folks who otherwise would not have a lawyer. I mean, there's a lot you could do to make Ivy Peters um, a more redeemable character, or at least as redeemable, or at least as honorific as Captain Forrester. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think there's something that's going on with that with Cather. Um, let's move on to our final batch of questions here. Um, this has to do a little bit more with Neil and his point of view and his perspective on Mrs. Forrester. So Othello had this question, how does Neil's feelings for Mrs. Forrester shape his interactions and views of the other women as compared to her? And then Othello had another question. Uh, they had this question, how does Neil's uh, vision of Mrs. Forrester shatter? What does this revelation change for Neil? So we, what makes her a lost lady in Neil's eyes. Um, and then Zanesha had this question, what did the captain mean when he was burning to ask the question about where she put her exquisiteness when she was with Ellinger? Now, I think that's actually from the perspective of Neil, not the captain, but we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at that passage. And so for this section of the discussion, I really wanna talk about the complexity and what's very interesting in this novel that's going on with Neil and the way that he thinks of uh, Mrs. Forrester. Um, so this has to do with narrative point of view and perspective as well. So just in a general way, I want to I want to suggest that this there's the way the novel is set up from the beginning. Um, Neil's character as a young boy going out into the to the Meadowlands with his friends and maybe hoping they'll get a glimpse of Mrs. Forrester because she's such a nice lady. Um, his view of her is transformed when he's injured um, in the woodpecker incident, right? And he falls from the tree and he has the broken bone and they're waiting for the doctor. And he's waiting in this exquisite house that he'd never been able to go anywhere, let alone into Mrs. Forrester's bedroom. And he's laid down in the bed and she is touching him and she's, and something happens in this moment. And it's complicated because at this point, you know, he's pre-sexual, but he has a fixated image of Mrs. Forrester. Is it a mother image? Is it a sister image? Is it a lover image? What is it? Okay. But it is very, again, intimate the way Cather describes it. Um, let's take a look at that passage on, on page 25 in my book. So look at this description. I have it highlighted on our, our page here. Um, uh, I'm afraid it's broken. We're going to have to get the doctor here. Are you, does it hurt very much? No, he said faintly. He was in pain, but he felt weak and contented. The room was cool and dusky and quiet. At his house, everything was horrid when one was sick. What soft fingers Mrs. Forrester had and what a lovely lady she was. Inside the lace ruffle of her dress, he saw her white throat rising and falling so quickly. Suddenly she got up to take off her glittering rings. And we had the other example where she took off the rings uh, the night uh, with Mr. Forrester. Um, she had not thought of them before, shed them off her fingers with a quick motion as if she were washing her hands and dropped them into Mary's broad palm. The little boy was thinking that he could probably never be in so nice a place again. The windows went almost down to the baseboard like doors and the closed green shutters let in streaks of sunlight that quivered on the polished floor and the silver things on the dresser. The heavy curtains were looped back with thick cords like ropes. The marble topped washstand was big as a sideboard. The massive walnut furniture was all inlaid with pale colored woods. Neil had a scroll saw and this inlay interested him. So he's impressed with Mrs. Forrester, her refinement. 
and this furniture that we're later told in the story is kind of out of fashion and nobody would like it anymore. And maybe it was never truly in fashion. But um, for him, he's definitely infatuated. It leaves quite an impression. He can't get it out of his mind. Um, and um, there, he looks better now, doesn't he? Uh, Mary, Mrs. Forrester ran her fingers through his black hair and lightly kissed him on the forehead. Whoa. Oh, how sweet, how sweet she smelled. So come on. It's going to be hard for Neil from this point on. And this is, we don't even have to get into the psychology of it. He's fixated on this woman. She is an angel figure to him. She's a savior. She's a mother, whatever it is. Um, and uh, from that moment on, he's got her fixed in a certain way that is probably not fair. She cannot live up to these standards, right? And by the way, it's not her job to live as an object of his adoration and respect, right? It's her job, her life is to be a fully formed human being with all the needs and wants and desires and those sort of things and mistakes that are made by all human beings, right? And so I really think Cather is asking us to think about that tension between the, the overly high expectations that Neil has and the reality of the world around him. Um, now, when we have this uh, stunning depiction on page 81, let me find the passage. And it's here in um, the seventh chapter of the first book where uh, Neil, a little bit slow on the uptake, is going to walk over and present to an older Mrs. Forrester now uh, a bouquet of roses that he's picked. And he's about to have this primal scene where he realizes that this adoring, angelic like woman is, while her husband is away, um, taking care of this, this banking crisis and the thing that's about to make them all poor, she has this visitor at her house. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at the scenes earlier, Neil should have figured it out that the minute that the captain left, Frank showed up, he's staying at the hotel. Uh, come on, put two and two together, right? Um, but anyway, um, an affection of impulse uh, an impulsive, of, this is a beautiful passage. I want to spend some time looking at this. An impulse of affection and guardianship drew Neil up the poplar bordered road in the early light, though he did not go near the house itself, but on the second bridge, cut around through the meadow and onto the marsh. Uh, the sky was burning with the soft pink and silver of a cloudless summer dawn. The heavy bowed grass splashed him to the knees. All over the marsh, snow on the mountain, globed with dew, made cool sheets of silver, and the swamp milkweed spread its flat raspberry-colored clusters. There was an almost religious purity about the fresh morning air, the tender sky, the grass and flowers with the sheen of early dew upon them. There was in all the living things something limpid and joyous, like the wet morning call of the birds flying up through the unstained atmosphere. Out of the saffron east, a thin, yellow, wine-like sunshine began to gild the fragrant meadow and the glistening tops of the grove. Neil wondered why he did not often come over like this to see the day before men and their activities had spoiled it, while the morning was still unsullied like a gift handed down from heroic ages. Now, for me, I think that Cather wants us to understand that Neil is a very sensitive but a superbly overly romantic character. He is great in one sense because he's open to this impression of nature. When we talked about the romantics, this is a sublime moment. He's so romantic and he's got these idealized views. The rose, remember how we talked in class about how the rose suggests virginity, purity. He's gonna pick these wild roses. This poor woman who's, whose husband is off dealing with this crisis that's about to turn her life upside down. Oh, my Lord. And then he says that the, the before men spoiled the day uh, and, and while the morning was still unsullied, like uncorrupted, right? It's so romantic, like a gift handed down from the heroic ages, right? All this. So this makes me think this is a clue that Cather wants us to sort of see Neil as kind of ironic. And by the end of the novel, he has to reconcile the fact that he perhaps has had too much of an idealized view of this woman and this time frame and these people, right? Under the bluffs that overhung the marsh, he came upon thickets of wild roses with flaming buds 
at just beginning to open, right? Uh, where he where they had opened, their petals were stained with that burning rose color, which is always gone by noon. A dye made of sunlight and morning and moisture, so intense that it cannot possibly last, must fade like ecstasy. Neil took out his knife and began to cut the stiff stems crowded with red thorns. I mean, it's all just dripping with this romance. I mean, even the thorns, it's almost like it's a sacrifice he's making here. He would make a bouquet for a lovely lady, a bouquet gathered off the cheeks of morning. These roses only half awake in the defenselessness of their utter beauty. He would leave them just outside one of the French windows of her bedroom. When she opened her shutters to let in the light, she would find them and they would perhaps give her a sudden distaste for coarse worldlings like Frank Ellinger <laughs> after tying his flowers with a twist of meadow grass. Yet he went up the hill through the grove and softly around the still house, uh, Forrester's own room where the door light green shutters were closed. I mean, come on, this is great tension and action. This is better than any modern Hollywood romance movie, right? As he bent to place the flowers on the sill, he heard from within a woman's soft laughter, impatient, indulgent, teasing, eager. Then another laugh, very different, a man's. And it was fat and lazy, ended in something like a yawn. Neil found himself at the foot of the hill on the wooden bridge. I love how Cather just immediately, he runs away. He can't, under, he can't handle this primal scene. His face hot, his temples beating, his eyes blind with anger. In his hand, he still carried the prickly bunch of wild roses. Now they're prickly. Um, he threw them over the wire fence into a mud hole. The cattle had trampled under the bank of the creek. He did not know whether he had left the house by driveway or had come down through the shrubbery. In that instant, between stooping to the window, uh, between between stooping to the window sill and rising, he had lost one of the most beautiful things in his life. Before the dew dried, the morning had been wrecked for him, and all subsequent mornings, he told himself bitterly, this day saw the end of that admiration and loyalty that had been like a bloom on his existence. He could never recapture it. It was gone like the morning freshness of the flowers. Lilies that fester, he muttered, lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. Grace, variety, the lovely voice, the sparkle of fun and fancy in those dark eyes, all this was nothing. It was not a moral scruple she had outraged, but an aesthetic ideal. Beautiful women whose beauty meant more than it said, was their brilliancy always fed by something coarse and concealed? Was that their secret? So we get into this idea of the, the purity that's been sullied by her being with Frank. And as a grown up, you would hope that Neil would come to understand she just, she's horny. She, she, she wants to be with someone. We all have needs, right? She, she, she wants touch. She wants, and she likes Frank. She's attracted to Frank. She's obviously very distraught when he marries Constant, Constance Ogden. So here, I think at first glance, we're like, I don't know how you respond to this. I'm like, Neil, you're so naive, dude. Like someday you'll understand, right? And yet his entire world is, is ruined. Now here, I wanna stress something that I find quite interesting. I think that Neil is an analog for uh, Mrs. Forrester in the way that she's kept. I used that term earlier. He, in this desire to go in and save her repeatedly, he is expressing a patriarchal sort of idea that women need to be saved. Later on, he questions, why is she so attracted to Ivy Peters? Ah, uh, I can't stand this guy and I can't stand Frank. They're ugly. And, and they, he doesn't understand why she might be attracted to him. You know, And the reader may wonder if she's just doing it out of some sort of business transaction. I, I think she's attracted to men and, and she likes being with men and he just cannot handle that. And so he's most offended here, not that she's fooling around on Captain Forrester, but that he's, that she has, see how self-centered it is. It, it, it's a violation of his aesthetic principle. This beautiful woman should be with beautiful people. Now, now, you know, Captain Forrester at this point, he's like Jabba the Hutt. He's this, he's described as this increasingly corpulent, uh, fat, uh, you know, crippled, um, unable to sort of do anything, uh, sort of decaying figure. And yet um, in, in Neil's eyes, he, he, he warrants someone like Mrs. Forrester, but Frank and then Ivy uh, later, they don't. And so 
it's this kind of idea of initiation that we've talked about all semester. He's coming to understand that this ideal, this romanticized, lovely view is sometimes reverts down to just base impulses and desires, right? Okay, so that's one thing to think of. And, and I, I think because Neil is committed to this, rescuing, uh, and again, it's offensive when you think about Prince Charming coming in or the saviorism sort of idea in men when they wanna come in and save the lost lady, save the lost woman or whatever. She doesn't need his help, good Lord. And yet he sacrifices a year of his going back to Boston to try and help her in the period where they have the second stroke and into the period where Mr. Forrester dies, Captain Forrester dies. He sacrifices uh, a lot in the first part of the book as well. He's almost, where, where is Neil's girlfriends or boyfriends? Where's his intimate encounters? There's no mention of any sort of intimacy with him. Now he is with Miss Forrester several times throughout the novel. He's even with her in a circumstance um, when she comes over to the office and he cuts the phone cord because she's found out that Frank has gotten married and he is going to save her yet again, right? He saves her by clipping the phone cord. Um, and he undresses her and puts her in, in a robe and puts her to sleep in his own bed. Never any sense, all that sensuous language that we saw with Catherine earlier, none of that is associated with Neil and Mrs. Forrester. So we might ask ourselves, what is his relationship with her? What is his relationship with women in general or men or any other sort of intimate partners? There's no mention of that at all. There is one scene where Mrs. Forrester talks about Neil and how much he hopes that now that he's come back in book two from Boston, that he's been having lots of social entertainment and seeing lots of uh, young girls. Um, this is chapter two in book two, uh, where Neil goes out to visit her and he's having this conversation uh, with Morse Forrester. And um, she, she's asking him, she says, how handsome he's grown. Isn't the old judge proud of you? Um, uh, he called me up last night and began sputtering. It's only fair to warn you, ma'am, that I have a very handsome boy over here. And again, no discussion from Neil's perspective. We never learn about if he's so handsome, where are the women in his life or the men in his life? As if I hadn't known you would be. Um, and now you're a man and you've seen the world. Well, what have you found in it? Nothing so nice as you, Mrs. Forrester. <laughs> he's gone off to Boston. He's in college. He's at MIT studying architecture. He could be having dates. He could, And he's fixated. And that's what I'm saying. He's almost in the same circumstances as Mrs. Forrester. She is married to this, uh, this image, this ideal of the past, Captain Forrester. And he's in decline. Neil is wedded to this image of Mrs. Forrester. That's not a realistic image. It's an image of her as an angel, as a savior on a pedestal. His world was changed when she found out that she could be so, you know, uh, so petty as to want to be with Frank. And now he has this still, he is still has this ideal set in his mind. Have you sweethearts? Perhaps. Are they pretty? Why, why they? Isn't one enough? One is too many. I want you to have half a dozen and still save the best for us. One would take everything. If you had her, you would not have come home at all. I wonder if you know how we've looked for you. She looked at his hand and turned a seal ring about and so she's gone through and she's seeing how he's sort of grown as a college student. And do you see what she's saying there? Like he, why would there be more than one? He has a puritanical prudish view of the world, probably fixated from this moment that he, he got sort of this ideal in his mind of Mrs. Forrester. Um, okay, uh, moving on. If you look at chapter three, then now we have Neil learning that this Ivy Peters has been hanging around the place. He's drained the meadow and now he's planted wheat. And again, that probably makes more sense than just leaving the ground, you know, as a wetland and not using it to make a crop. And and uh, who 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 has enough time and resources to just keep land out in front of their house, uh, you know, unplanted? rich people, right? And so anyway, Neil has this dripping antagonism for Ivy Peters. He just comes off through Neil's perspective as this awful, ginger, grotesque character, unmannered. He doesn't take his hat off. This whole first section is all about how crude his manners is. He goes up, uh, he's talking to Mrs. Forrester when she's in her morning attire. Oh my God, her throat is exposed. She's not wearing a hat. This is not how you do things. And we're supposed to understand that now we're in book two 
times are changing. The sort of exquisite manners, the aristocratic views of the first part of the book are being translated in whatever Ivy Peters rolls, uh, rolls in with. Um, one morning, as Neil was coming up through the grove, he heard laughter by the gate, and there he saw Ivy with his gun talking to Mrs. Forrester. She was bareheaded, her skirts blowing in the wind, her arm through the handle of a big tin bucket that rested on the fence beside her. Ivy stood with his hat on his head, but there was in his attitude that unmistakable something which shows that a man is trying to make himself agreeable to a woman. He was telling her a funny story, perhaps in the improper one, for it brought out the naughtiest laugh with something nervous and excited in it, as if it were going too far. At the end of his story, Ivy himself broke into his farm hand guffaw. Miss Forrester shook her finger at him and catching up her pail, ran back into the house. She bent a little with its weight, but Ivy made no offer to carry it for her. Now, look at what's going on here. Ivy's telling her an off-color joke or something. A little, and Ivy isn't afraid to go up to a woman who's his better. He's not impressed by Mrs. Forrester at all. Um, as far as that goes, he's willing to sort of try and sort of flirt with her and it's working. And this is what I think is happening here. Neil is convinced that Ivy's taking advantage of Mrs. Forrester when she probably is attracted to Ivy because he's giving her attention. He's a young man. Um, he has business acumen. It's maybe a little bit, uh, you know, illegal, but he's making money. He's coming up. He's on the upswing. And Mr. Forrester's on the decline. He's decaying. His body is a little decaying. He's going to be dead in a few chapters. And here's this young upstart. But but uh, boy, I'll tell you what, Neil does not like what this guy represents. And again, do we understand Cather offering a critique of whatever Ivy Peters represents as a character in this community, in Nebraska, in the homesteading era, in this period towards the turn of the century, where it's going to shift Maybe Catherine thinks it shifts more towards a commercial view, a, a materialistic view. Um, maybe she's a snob and she doesn't like these farm boys coming up and, and, you know, moving, literally takes possession of this house. By the end of the novel, he buys the house and moves in with his own wife. And this intimacy with Mrs. Forrester, and I think that Neil sees her as a victim of his attention when she probably is reciprocating. And I think the fact that she has the naughty laugh and all that sort of stuff shows that she's kind of into it. I think that she's she's kind of a you know um, she's a sensuous woman. I, I think that she I think that she likes being with men, um, and he just can't handle that. Um, so uh, so anyway, when he he goes to see her a few pages later, and and in this uh, he he's uh, he sees Ivy, and he starts to hear there's this reputation that she's developing in town from hanging around Ivy too much. And this is perfectly captured in the same chapter where Neil is trying to say to Mrs. Forrester, look, your reputation is kind of going down the tubes here because you're spending too much time with this Ivy. And she's telling, first, it begins with him telling Captain Forrester this story about how he ran into somebody because now, you know, now Neil's out and about in the world. And he said, uh, Neil had met an old mine owner. And remember what I said earlier about why are we valorizing people that bit, plundered all this wealth out of the West and took it away? Um, who was living in Deadwood when the railroad first came in. When Neil asked him if he had known Daniel Forrester, the old gentleman said, Forrester? Was he the one with the beautiful wife? Like objectification. Why is it so important that Miss Forrester be this thing for all these men? Why can't she be herself? I wonder if Cather's messing around with that sort of note. And so when Neil walks up um, and says, you know, you, you, that guy is a jerk. He's got terrible manners. And she says, uh, she says, um, uh, uh, Neil, you have to, uh, uh, I'll give him a beating and teach him how to speak to you. No, no, Neil. Remember, we must get along with Ivy Peters. We simply have to. There was a note of anxiety over her voice and she caught his arm. You see, Neil didn't like the fact that he invited himself to lunch and just told her that they were going to need the barn the next day, right? Um, and so you don't have to take anything from him or stand his bad manners. Anybody else would pay as much uh, for the land as he does. And then we start to realize that that's not what it is. Miss Forrester actually likes Ivy. And this is the thing that Neil can't handle. Um, uh, but he has a lease for five years and could make it very disagreeable for us, don't you see? Besides, 
There's more to it than that. He's invested a little money for me in Wyoming. He gets splendid land from the Indian some way for next to nothing. Don't tell your uncle. I've no doubt it's crooked, but the judge is like Mrs. Forrester, Mr. Forrester. His methods don't work nowadays. He will never get us out of debt, dear man. He can't get himself out. Ivy Peters is terribly smart, you know. He owns half the town already. Not quite, said Neil grimly. He got hold of a good deal of property. He'll take advantage of anybody's necessity. You know he's utterly unscrupulous, don't you? Why don't you let Mr. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, it was too little. Only a few hundred dollars I'd saved on the housekeeping. They would put into something safe at 6%. I know you don't like it, Ivy, and he knows it. You don't like Ivy. He's always at his worst before you. He's not so bad as, as his face, for instance, she laughed nervously. He honestly wants to help us out and of the hole we're in. Coming and going all the time as he does, he sees everything. I really think he hates to have me work so hard. Next time you have something to invest, I'll do it for you, blah, blah, blah. He's trying to come in and rescue him, right? And what he is missing in all this, she says, uh, Miss Forrester took his arm and drew him into the lane. But my dear boy, you don't know nothing. You know nothing about these business schemes. You're not clever that way. It's one of the things I love you for because you're kind of innocent, naive, and romantic. But the real world, women have desires they have affairs, they have sex, they're not angels, they're not on a pedestal. In the real world, when you think about this generation that came through and built the railroad and all the mines, they tore the stuff out of the ground, they took advantage of the Indians, this new generation. You, None of this is in its romanticized view, this great thing that you think it is. It's all just money, and she later says, money is important, Neil. And she's just trying to be honest, she says, I don't admire people who cheat Indians. Indeed, I don't. Miss Forrester, rascality isn't the only thing that succeeds in, be in business. It succeeds faster than anything else, right? And he's still trying, he's still lecturing her. And she finally has to tell him this. Like, um, uh, she said, I went, listen, Neil, I went to Glenwood Springs over the winter and I had so much fun. My invalid husband wasn't there weighing me down. I went dancing um, and Ivy Peters washed my place while I was away. I had no clothes, but they made clothes for me. I always know how I'm looking and I looked well enough. The men thought so. I looked happier than any woman there. They were nearly all younger, much, but they seemed dull, bored to death. After a glass or two of champagne, they went to sleep and had nothing to say. I always look better after the first glass. It gives me a little color. It's the only thing that does. I accepted the Dalzell's invitation with a purpose. I wanted to see whether I had anything left worth saving. And I have, I tell you. You wouldn't hardly believe it. I could hardly believe it, but I still have. By this time, they had reached the bridge, a bare white floor in the moonlight. Mrs. Forrester had seen, been quickening her pace all the while. So that's what I'm struggling for, to get out of this hole. She looked about as if she had fallen into a deep well out of it. When I'm gone alone here for months altogether, I plan and plot. If it weren't for that, as Neil walked back to his room behind the law offices, he felt frightened for her. When women begin to talk about steel feeling young, didn't it mean that something had broken? Two or three years, she said. He shivered. Only yesterday, old Dr. Dennison had proudly told him that Captain Forrester might live a dozen. We are keeping his general health up remarkably, and he was originally a man of iron. What hope was there for her? He could still feel her hand upon his arm as she urged him faster and faster up the lane. <laughs> he cannot He cannot get away from her and he's meddling in this. And she is like, I want to live. I am not over the hill. I want to have a life. And if I'm stuck with this man, even though I love him and he's my companion, you have to understand, especially without money, we're in very constrained circumstances, and I still have a lot of life left to live. So, you know, she's so pragmatic in all of this. And, and again, I think, uh, you know, honest about her needs. And, um, and still, there's this idea that this young kid who has not seen that much of the world, he's going to deign just because he's a man to save this lost lady. Um, now, he try he saves her again. And I don't know how you read that scene where she comes over to the law offices and makes the phone call and she's drunk. Um, he cuts the phone line, his need to intervene there. Um, the uh, After the second stroke and uh, 
and the captain is laid out even more and the townspeople start coming over and snooping through all the cupboards and all that sort of stuff. It's just too much for Neil. And so he puts off going back to Boston for a year. He's doing all these things. He's, he's, a, he's, in a, he's a codependent, basically. Um, he delays his trip. Uh, he thinks about this as some sort of valorizing sort of thing. And I, you know, you can almost see it as he's almost a stalker at this point. Um, this is how he puts it. Uh, at night when he was alone, when Mrs. Forrester had gone to bed and the captain was resting quietly, Neil found a kind of solemn happiness in his vigils. It had been hard to give up that year. Most of his classmates were younger than he. It had cost him something. But now that he had taken the step, he was glad. As he put in the night hours, sitting first in one chair and then in another, reading, smoking, getting up. Uh, lunch to keep himself awake. He had the satisfaction of those who keep faith. He liked being alone with the old things that had seemed so beautiful to him in his childhood. These were still the most comfortable chairs in the world, and he would never like any picture so well as William Tell's chapel, and he goes through all these sort of things. No other house could take the place of this one in his life. Um, so he is sacrificing himself. Really, he's trying to preserve something that he doesn't want to see disappear. Maybe he's also fighting against his own growth, maturity, and, immort and mortality. Who knows, right? Then um, a little bit further on, um, after Captain Forrester dies and we have uh, Mrs. Forrester being left alone, uh, this is chapter eight in the second book, uh, she is entertaining these young men. She's getting quite a reputation. We come to understand that she wants to have this refinement, just like she had described being in Glenwood Springs and knowing that she's still attracted to these young men, but they're so bored. They don't have refinement. They don't have minors, uh, manners. She can bring this to them. And so she even says to him uh, here, she says, come by and see one of these parties. I'd like to have you come with these young men. We need to make these young men in town more mannered. Uh, since you mind what people say, Neil, aren't you afraid they'll be saying you're a snob? Just because you've been to Boston and seen a little of the world, you mustn't be so stiff, so, so superior. See, this is the argument I've been making throughout the novel. And I think that Mrs. Forrester is right. He, he's got... Uh, an impression of her that's incorrect and it's not fair for any woman to live up to those sort of standards and she has called him out here on his snobbishness and his prudery that is unearned snobbishness by the way what has he done in the world um he's coming and telling her you're developing quite a reputation don't say anything over the phone line the the phone lady will talk right um uh and when she persuades him to come to the dinner and you know, it's described as kind of torturous for Neil. I don't know. For me, I think that I, I'm, Ivy is okay. He's mixing cocktails. He's doing what he can. Um, they're having conversations. Um, and Mrs. Forrester is trying to um, tell the boys in almost a fantasy type way, I'm going to go to the Sierra Nevadas and get a place up there. And when I have my money put together, which which Ivy is helping her to do, this is her opportunity for escape. This is what she's doing it on her own with Ivy's help. The only people that are really helping her who aren't trying to keep her preserved in this this mausoleum of a house is is actually everybody but Neil. He he wants her to be, again, a kept woman in a certain way. Um and she has this fantasy of going to the California, to the Sierras, to, her, to where she grew up. She's going to invite all these young men to come. Um, and uh, they, they talk about how this led to the uh, situation where, um, where she had uh, uh, met Captain Forrester after the climbing accident and all that sort of stuff. We see how vivacious and how active she was out climbing these these cliffs and things like that in, in California. She wants to live in the Sierra Nevadas. That's kind of a, this is not, you know, the 20th century. This is, it's still pretty much wilderness area. She has a lot left in her. Um, and, uh, and so uh, there's this idea that Neil walks away from this, uh, this story. Um, the boys were mighty moved by this story about how they, she found this uh, companionship with Mr. Uh, Captain Forrester. The boys were genuinely moved. While she was answering their questions, Neil thought about the first time he had ever heard her tell that story. Mr. Dalzell had stopped off with a party of friends from Chicago. Marshall Field and the president of the Union Pacific were among them, he remembered, and they were going through in Mr. Dalzell's private car to hunt in the Black Hills. She had, after all, not changed so much since then. 
Neil felt tonight that the right man could save her, even now. She was still her indomitable self going through her old part, but only the stagehands were left to listen to her. All those who had shared in fine undertakings and bright occasions were gone. Again, I think a romanticized view. Um, uh, the right man could save her. I don't know about if I were a woman, I don't think I would like that patronizing attitude uh, from this young whelp. Um, so, uh, so anyway, there we have the end of the party. And then what we're near the end of the book now. And what is the final straw that breaks the, the back of the camel? Um, with summer months, Judge Pomeroy's health improved. Um, the uh, Neil's getting ready to go back uh, to, to, to Boston. And I would ask you in this final chapter, these final two chapters, is the perspective here Neil's as an unreliable narrator, perhaps one who's understanding we're supposed to see is ironic. He's seeing things in this neighborhood, in this community that we as readers, because we've seen it as well, but we're a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more mature than Neil. We see things a little bit differently. And so there's this dramatic irony between what we see and what he is perceiving. Is it Cather, as she's finishing the novel, trying to put the final point on some element of a theme or an argument? Um, and so that's the question I would ask you. And it sort of gets towards these final questions. This is where I think a fellow's question, it is said that Mrs. Forrester symbolizes the American dream in the fall of the West. So what does Mrs. Forrester's affair symbolize? It's a good question. And it's all being transacted in this final two chapters, these short chapters. And this chapter has that little interstitial part. Um, uh, actually, this is the last chapter, isn't it? Um, has this little interstitial part here with, the where is that page break right sweetness of spring where is that uh sweetness of spring there's the question of these this pioneer dream and again i'm not sure if it's supposed to be seen as this is Cather's view of this supposed to be ironic, but this is how, um, how Neil puts it. And this question that Othello asks, asking, what does the affair seem, seem to symbolize? It's an idealized view that has become corrupted in Neil's mind, right? And so we have this notion here um, uh, that is getting towards this notion of an idealized version of Mrs. Forrester, who after all is just a human and how it is unfair for Neil to put her on this pedestal and treat her in a way where it's, you know, where she can't possibly live up to that kind of uh, an ideal. And so, uh, and then he ties this and associates this with the past. Um, he says, uh, he had seen the end of an era, the sunset of the pioneer. Uh, he had come upon it when Already its glory was nearly spent. So the Buffalo Times, a traveler used to come upon the embers of a hunter's fire on the prairie. After the hunter was up and gone, the coals would be trampled out, but the ground was warm and the flattened grass where he had slept and where his pony had grazed told the story. She's very, Cather or Neil or both in this chapter are talking about these heroic figures who came and settled the West. She, she has a romanticized view of the vanished Indians. They're not, let's not talk about the fact that they're still around. We took their land. She has an idealized view of the Buffalo hunters or the people that came in, then the next generation. And then there was this generation that came in, platted out the roads, as we talked about earlier, put in the railroads, founded the communities, put stakes down and said, I'm going to you know, possess this land and put this house up. That's what she's describing here as this period before the West was settled, right? And she's into this dreaming period, right? And now she thinks just like her, her, her literary career, it's, it's becoming sullied by materialism. And now the, the creation phase is over. Now we're just gonna live our day-to-day -day lives. And if you grew up in rural Nebraska, like I did, you might find that kind of a small, insular, isolated, 
small-minded world as she did. Um, so there's this element of this, right? He had seen the end of the era, the sunset of the pioneer. Now, Neil doesn't feel that way. He feels that these people were heroes. He'd come upon it when it already had its glory spent, um, right? It was the very, uh, this was the very end of the road making West to go back to that first question about the roads that, um, that I think Zanesha had, had brought up. Um, the men who had put the plains and mountains under the iron harness were old. Some were poor and even the successful ones were hunting for rest and a brief reprieve from death. It was already gone that age. Nothing could ever bring it back. The taste and smell of song of it, the vision of those men had seen in the air and had followed and those that had caught in a kind of afterglow of their own faces and this would always be his. Um, that's an interesting overly romantic view of, of Western settlement, I think. Um, it was what he most held against Mrs. Forrester, that she was not willing to immolate herself. So this is an allusion to certain cultures where supposedly when the, the male figure in the household died, the wife, they would put his body on the funeral pyre and set it on fire. And the wife if she was a devoted wife, would join him in the fire and, and take her own life and go off into the afterlife together. And so he resents the fact, this is where I think, this is where you would make a case that Cather, a sophisticated writer at this point in time, an artist, she certainly doesn't believe that women should immolate themselves in the name of their husbands, does she? Um, even if it's a symbolic immolation, like Miss Forrester, when her husband died, she should have just been uh, a widow pining away in a rocking chair in that old house or something like that, right? That's the kind of uh, 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 allusion to immolation here. Um, that she was not willing to immolate herself like the widow of all these great men and die with the pioneer period in which she belonged. That she preferred life on any terms. In the end, Neil went away without bidding her goodbye. He went away with weary contempt for her in his heart. Um, this is why though, he goes up to see her one last time before he leaves. Ivy Peters comes into the kitchen door, walked up behind her and unconcernedly put both arms around her, his hands meeting over her breasts. She did not move, did not look up, but went on rolling out the pastry, okay? Now, how do you interpret this scene? For me, I don't see in this scene from Neil's perspective, maybe he's just jealous. Or like with Frank, he doesn't understand what Miss Forrester saw in that guy and it just upsets his ascetic sensibility. We know how much he hates Ivy Peters and there is a suggestion in the early part of the book that Ivy Peters, poison Ivy, poisons dogs. But is this fair? Is this true? I mean, I don't know why I'm trying to go to the defense of Ivy Peters so much. Um, but I find it interesting that Cather maybe do something a little bit more um, uh, a, a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, uh, sophisticated here, because from Neil's perspective, um, Mrs. Forrester as a piece of property that belonged first and foremost to an angelic sort of mother-like, idealized uh, on a pedestal view, or the wife of Captain Forrester, how dare you touch and betray and sully this, you know, angelic figure? Or is he jealous of Ivy Peters because he himself has a desire towards Mrs. Forrester? And it's, you know, this platonic unrequited sort of, and he, he is just never able to act on it. There's something going on here. But nonetheless, if you look at the scene, you could interpret it differently because um, she doesn't shrug her whole shoulders or try and get Ivy Peters off of her. Um, they're clearly intimate with each other. So this is obviously not the first time. Even a bold person like Ivy Peters wouldn't do this, uh, an asshole, uh, un unmannered young swain. They've obviously been intimate with each other. And um, I kind of feel like she goes on doing the pastry. This is something you might see in a Hallmark special of a romantic moment where the you know the the woman's doing a domestic task and the man comes up behind her and, and embraces her and and may, maybe it's a pervy sort of molesting sort of thing where he's just taking advantage of her because she needs the money for these three years she's going to go to sierra nevadas or whatever but like i wonder i mean there's enough room in there to think about how uh that neil is just being unfair 
and and Ivy is actually maybe he's jealous of Ivy for being bold enough to move in and say like I could be with a person like uh like uh like uh uh, uh Mrs. Forrester, right? So anyway, um, he Neil went down the hill for the last time. He said as he crossed the bridge in the evening light. So we're back to that bridge, right? And there's some symbolism in the gardens, the bridges, the flowers that are associated with Neil, right? The, again, the flowers that are kind of a romanticized version, the same sort of thing we saw in Paul's case, right? Um, he's a sensitive kid. I'm not saying he's an idiot. I feel bad for him. Um, he has a romanticized view of the world and the world is crushing it, right? Um, and, uh, he had crossed the bridge in the evening that light for the last time, and it was even so. He never went to the poplar boarded road again. He had given her a, a year of his life. Really? Isn't that a patronizing thing to say? He'd given her a year of his life, and she had thrown it away. Wow. I didn't know it was her job to please him. He had helped the captain to die peacefully, he believed, and now it was the captain who seemed the reality. All those years, he had thought it was Mrs. Forrester who had made the house so different from any other. But ever since the captain's death, it was a house where old friends like his uncle were betrayed and cast off, where common fellows behaved after their kind and knew a common woman when they saw her. Again, it could be that we're supposed to understand she truly is a lost lady. How did she lose her way? Oh, this is terrible. I hope she redeems herself. Or... It could be perceived as this is Neil being unfair. Um, if she had not had the nature of a spaniel, he told himself, he would never have gone back after the first time. It took two doses to cure him. Well, he had had them. Nothing she could ever do would in the least matter to him again. He had news of her now and then, and it goes on like this. Um, uh, uh, Miss Forster's name is everywhere coupled with Peter's. She does not look happy and fear her breath is her, her health is failing, but she has put herself in such a position that her husband's friends cannot help her. Now, I want you to keep in mind, we know that by the end of the novel, she does find another husband and a happy marriage at the end. So let's ask ourselves, is she really a lost lady? Is she really screwing up here? She's trying to put money together. If Ivy's using her, she's using Ivy, it seems to me. The perception that she is all being talked about and um, Mrs. Forrester's name is everywhere, comes from the judge who just a few chapters earlier used the N-word. Do we trust him? Is he the best judge? He, like Neil, is stuck in the past, right? There's one way that you might think about that. Um, but um, after his uncle's death, Neil heard that Ivy Peters had at last bought the Forrester place and had brought a wife from Wyoming to live there. Mrs. Forrester had gone west, people supposed to California. It was years before Neil could think of her without chagrin. Now, this is where we have some redemption. Like, Cather just couldn't leave it at this. Um, uh, he came, uh, Neil, think of her without chagrin. But eventually, after she had drifted out of his kin, when he did not know if Daniel Forrester's widow were living or dead, Daniel Forrester's wife returned to him in a bright, impersonal memory. He came to be very glad that he had known her and that she had had a hand in breaking him into life. He was known... He has known pretty women and clever ones since then, but never one like her, as she was in her best days. Her eyes, when they laugh for a moment into one's own, seem to promise wild delight that he has not found in life. I know where it is, they seem to say, I could show you. He would like to call up the shade of the young Mrs. Forrester as the witch of Endor called up Samuels and challenge it. Demand the secret of that ardor. Ask her whether she had really found some ever-blooming, ever-burning, ever-piercing joy, or whether it was all fine play acting. Probably she had found no more than another, but she had always the power of suggestion, suggesting things much lovelier than herself, as the perfume of a single flower may call up the whole sweetness of spring. Now, that's an interesting analogy because... We're told that Cather at this time was trying to write in a way that the writing would evoke this whole garden of sensibility with just a single flower. We have the flower association with the romanticized view from Neil. He's gotten older. He's moved through life. He's come to this realization because he's, I think, come to see that he was naive and overly 
um, simplistic and romanticized in his view. Um, and he realizes now that she never really knew all the answers either, but she just had a confidence and a way of uh, embracing life that made him feel that way. And so in the coda to the book, where he meets Ed Elliott, and he tells the story of how she went down to Brazil. She, oh, well, she, she met this uh, mining magnate in California. They get married, they go down to Brazil. And she seems to have had a happy conclusion to her life. And, um, um, and you have, you know, it has kind of a happy ending, right? Um, now we might ask ourselves, is the only way a woman can be happy in this universe is by marrying some man to come and rescue her? Well, this is one of the questions I have for the book. If if Cather is asking us to think about the tragedy here, and again, it could be ironic, but if the tragedy is that the West and this period of time, this dreaming period of the pioneer that she describes, if it was a facilitating period for uh, for Mrs. Forrester, where she could thrive as this upper class mannered woman, right? whose identity was always composed in relation to her husbands and hopefully husbands of means, right? That is the tragedy that she found herself in this period that was so much better than the period we're moving into. If the, the tragedy is that she lost this beautiful era that she was a part of and she no longer fits in the new era, or is the tragedy the fact that she was forced to live that way in a period of time where women didn't really have that many opportunities other than in association with their husbands and as kind of tag-alongs and that sort of thing. What is the tragedy that's being described here? And this reads us, this leads us to our concluding thoughts of the story. Um, so there's a couple of things that I want to just finally wrap up with. I know this has been a long discussion, but if you're into this novel, I, I appreciate your allowing me to get my own thoughts out on on what I think this this novel portrays, because I'm working on an academic book right now that deals with the image of houses in homesteading narratives. And I'm interested in this house and what it symbolizes and the professor's house. There's a novel called The Professor's House and what that house symbolizes and what the houses and other works of, of uh, Mari Sandoz and Willa Cather and Wright Morris and all these other Nebraska writers, there's a lot of attention to houses. And what does this house symbolize? And if we think about from the historical essay, what's going on here, um, one of the things that's being described is what I think is um, captured in this question. Um, I forget who asked this question. What does, oh, he's a nice boy stranded like the rest of us mean? Well, this is, gets us to the point of composition of this story and what Cather seems to be trying to do. Because Cather herself spent about eight years in Nebraska. This is what I learned and we reiterated when I went to this New York conference uh, several weeks ago. Um, she spent the majority of her life in the cities on the Eastern seaboard. And, um, and so uh, she felt trapped when she was in Red Cloud um, she felt out of place. We read this in Paul's case and other stories. And her fiction up to this period has really had a lot of depictions of characters who are out of place in rural, let's just say rural Nebraska, right? Farming rural Nebraska um, around the turn of the century, right? Um, in the late 1800s, um, Jim Burden and my Antonia he leaves Nebraska, he finds it small-minded, goes off to bigger things, and yet sentimentally returns when he needs his battery recharged, so to speak, uh, but does not want to live in Nebraska. Thea Kronberg um, in, uh, or Thea in uh, Song of the Lark, same sort of thing. She's this opera singer who wants to make it big. She wants to get outside of Nebraska, right? Um, Claude Wheeler in the novel I was just describing, one of ours. He could not hate farming more. He does not want to be in a farm. He wants to go see the rest of the world. Uh, we saw it in Paul's case. There's a short story called The Sculptor's Funeral, which I sometimes assign to students that Willa Cather wrote uh, earlier in this period, where there's a, a, a character who becomes a great artist, and uh, but he is still you know, characterized by his hometown in Nebraska as this effeminate nobody who didn't know how to ranch cattle and things like that. Um, and uh, then there's a, a short story called A Wagner Matinee, where um, a, a woman who had been dragged to the West with her husband, as was often the case, and they had a homestead, 
and she gave up all these cultural touchstones in the East, comes to visit her nephew in Boston, and they go to a musical performance, and her tears are welling up in her eyes. And the final conclusion of the story is, don't make me go back to that crappy place, right? So we know Cather had this sense about Nebraska and these areas that is a little bit more complicated. And so it's not surprising to have a line about being stranded. Um, and then we had that question from Othello about what the uh, the affair symbolized. But um, also just to wrap up, let's take a look at this historical essay here, because um, what we have in this section, it comes back to that notion of Ivy Peters draining the swamp. And it is front and center in the first part of the book uh, when we conclude, uh, or I'm sorry, the first chapter after book two begins. And now we have this part two. Um, and um, here's the language. After Ivy had gone into the smoker, Neil sat looking out at the windings of Sweetwater and playing with this idea. The Old West had been settled by dreamers great-hearted adventurers who were unpractical to the point of magnificent, a courteous brotherhood, strong in attack, but weak in defense, who could conquer but could not hold. Now all the vast territory they had won was to be at the mercy of men like Ivy Peters, who had never dared anything, never risked anything. They would drink up the mirage, dispel the morning freshness, root out the great broodings of spirit of freedom, the generous, easy life of the great landholders, the space, the color, the princely carelessness of the pioneer, they would destroy and cut up into profitable bits as the match factory splinters the primeval forest. All the way from the Missouri to the mountains, this generation of shrewd young men trained to pre petty economies by hard times would do exactly what Ivy Peters had done when he drained the Forester March. If let's, let's look at the footnote and then look at the historical essay, what it has to say about this. Uh, Cather wrote her first biographer, E.K. Brown, about her vision of the pioneers, particularly the railroad builders. She especially remembered seeing Jim Hill, builder of the Northern Pacific Railroad, speak to the local Burlington workers when she was a child in Red Cloud. He impressed her even then as a great dreamer and great man. But let's be a little bit critical of this. This is through, through uh, Neil's perspective. And again, perhaps over really romanticized, but you could argue that it is also Cather's perspective, or she wrote this novel because she wanted to chronicle and without irony, say that this was a great period of time and these great men came in and settled the West and all that sort of, I hope that's not the case because I think she's a more sophisticated writer than that. And it's very problematic. Um, valorizing all these people who, who did real harm in some ways to the environment and to, you know, the Indian populations and to to communities that became small minded in some ways, and then um, you know were beholden to profit motives for sure with the railroad, and very a lot of these were very corrupt and the mining interests, and just a lot of really bad stuff came out of this extractive attitude towards the West, and she's portraying it as kind of a romanticized uh, project build. And it's both things; two things can be true at the same time, right? So it's it's both of these things, but it's complicated. And what we understand from the historical essay is if you look on this page of uh, where it describes what was going on around the time this novel was published, um, there's this discussion about how the world broke in two. Now, we've already covered that a little bit, but let's just finish up by discussing a few of the other points here. In fact, that's probably a good place to leave it. Uh, what is the... Uh, what a great work of literature and a great work of art can do is it can sustain these kind of multifaceted, many perspective readings where two different readers can have completely different impressions of this, this narrative at the same time. And it is ostensibly in the same way that Cather in her biographical materials, there was this prominent family in this town. You can probably relate to some elements of this. And it, she said, this would make a great subject matter for a book. And the whole point that we began with the question of who is the lost lady? Who says she's a lost lady? Is she a lost lady? Is that Cather's view? Is that Neil's view? That's what great literature does. And it makes you think about things. It really made me think about um, this place that I live and that many of you are going to school now. Um, there are so many stories about 
uh, settlement, resettlement, homesteading, and a lot of mythology around uh, these these per this period of time. And where she is describing this heroic adventure of the Western pioneers, there's so much of that that I can agree with for sure. And I'm enthralled by it and I'm excited by it like we all are. And then there are parts more and more in my, my life where I come to think about what's being left out and being um, sort of missed in part of this. And from a class perspective, I think it's problematic that Neil, who is kind of among this upper class, you know, not totally because he's his mother's dead and he's living with his uncle, but um, Judge Pomeroy is fairly you know, high up on the social strat strata, at least he was in Red Cloud, but in the novels trying to have us see that this, this group of people are on the wane, they're on the way out and they're being supplanted by a new group of people. And Catherine in her own writing, we see it in the historical essay and other things she, she wrote, she kind of comes to have this, this view of not just Nebraska, but America. America has given up this sort of heroic period and now we're moving on to something that she doesn't really attune to. As she says in that essay, Not Under 40, the world broke apart for me in, in 1922. And she, she really doesn't align herself with this modern world. So at the end of the day, don't you think maybe with an essay like Not Under 40, with what we learned in the, uh, the scholarly essay uh, that she, uh, she was wanting to make an artistic shift in her career at this time, and that she no longer feels at home in the art, the artistry, the values, and the views of this old world that she sees splitting apart after World War One. Maybe at the end of the day, it's Willa Cather who, and you know, indeed is the lost lady or the person who's feeling the most lost. Thank you for those of you who uh, watched this long exploration. Uh, I was super into this novel and, and I appreciate being able to work out some of these ideas on this, uh, this video presentation and hope some of it, at least some of it was useful if you're able to watch it. Uh, again, thank you very much for tuning in.